Man, I'm excited to be with you this morning. We've got a lot going on outside, as you can see. I've got to catch my breath. I haven't run in a while. Yeah, I feel 60. All right. <laughs> um, man, we are pumped to get started here in our new series. We're pumped to kick off the fall. We've got a lot of new things going on. Um, one of the things we've talked about here, and we haven't touched on it as much lately, but we have this model called Head, Heart, Hands. And our whole aim of it, it's in your bulletins today, and you can look at the graphic, but the whole aim of it is to look at what does it mean to allow Christ to fully change every part of our life? What does it mean to allow God to not just be this thing we do on Sundays once in a while, to not be a thing that we claim as a piece of our identity, as one of the many things we add to our title, but to be something that changes our mind, that changes the way we see the world, changes the way we feel, the things we desire, the things we run after. It changes the way we act. It changes the way we view our roles in family and in jobs. How does it change everything? And that's why we have this head, heart, hands model. Our aim was to create ministries, to create opportunities that over time, not all at once, but over time address every area of a person's discipleship and their development. Um, if you'll open your Bibles with me, we're going to read the story of Zacchaeus. And, hold on, it is Luke 19, and we're going to go from verse 1 to 10, I believe. So, join me there. This is our scripture reading, and it has to do with Zacchaeus, who was a very different guy. And, you know, um, he had his whole world flipped upside down. Everything changed for him. So let me hand me a Bible. I'm still having internet issues. My apologies. We got to fix this. Um, thank you. So we're going to read together. If you want to stand with me, we're going to read Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have ever cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this household, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. So we're looking at this head, heart, hands. We see the story of Zacchaeus, a guy who had his whole world flipped upside down. A guy whose values were instantly changed. The way he understood things changed. And that's what we're talking about as we go into this season, as we go into the foreseeable future, is God is looking to change every single aspect of the way we see the world, the way we experience life, the way we view our purpose. He wants every part of us to be impacted. So how do, today we're going to be talking about how do we begin the process of allowing him to change every part of who we are. In the 1970s, there was a story written for children called Fish is Fish. Anybody know it? Fish is Fish. Any teachers know it? It's a good story. And here's what the story was about. It was about a fish and a tadpole who live in a pond. And they've spent their whole life in this pond until one day the tadpole grows a pair of legs. And the tadpole gets out of the water and he goes out into the world. And eventually after surveying the world and seeing it, he comes back to see his friend, the fish, in the pond. 
And he looks at the fish, and he says, you can't believe what I saw. I saw a thing called a cow, and it had spots with four legs, and it ate grass. And he said, and then I saw these things with feathers and wings, and they flew, and they flew in the sky. And then I saw these things which walked on two legs. I think they were called humans. And they looked at their phones all the time. And uh, This is 1970s. They didn't get there yet. But he says, I saw all these things. And as he's describing it to the fish, the fish is trying to imagine everything he's talking about, but the fish has never set foot in that world. So this is kind of what it ends up looking like. As he describes a cow, he ends up picturing a fish as a cow eating grass. As he describes a bird, he pictures fish flying through the pond with feathers and wings. And as he pictures humans, as he describes them because he's never seen, him, seen them, he pictures fish walking upright with two legs. You know, the point is, is that oftentimes when we have not been exposed to the world that we're surrounded by, beyond the world we're surrounded by, beyond the society, beyond the friend groups, beyond the worldview that we have, we have a hard time envisioning something that tells us that everything's supposed to be very different and tries to describe it. They, when anything tries to describe to us a world that could be, but we've never entered into it, we just filter it through the way we see the world already around us. See, we're all living out a story based on what we've been told, based on what we've been surrounded by, based on what we've been raised in, and we have a worldview of how things are supposed to be, how things, what I am made for, what my identity is supposed to be, what the storyline of my work and my purpose is supposed to be. But the problem is when we've never ventured outside the worldview, the, the way we've seen the world, we have trouble envisioning anything greater, anything different, and at any time that we're told something different, that contra that's contrary to what we've been raised in, we just can't fathom it. Everything is fish. Everything is converted to fit the way we understand. So one of the questions I'm posing today is how do we allow our understanding? The Bible talks about he wants to transform your minds. He wants to transform your hearts. He wants to give you a new world. He wants to give you a new life. You're a new creation. It talks about this newness, this revolution in the way we see and act and feel and, and do life. How do we allow our lives and our views to change when we encounter Christ? See, this is why the gospel is so important. The word of God, one of the things that I love about it, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but the word of God, we've been taught, we've been raised, almost all of us to some degree been raised to take little pieces out of the Bible for doses of encouragement, or they're just weird stories that you go, I can't buy into that, that's weird. But the Bible is an overarching narrative, and it doesn't claim to be some good anecdotes. What it claims is that there's an overarching story that God is trying to tell you that there is a very clear vision he has of what he intends this world to be. There's a very clear vision from Genesis to Revelation of what he intends you to be. And if we don't get the full story, we don't see the world from his perspective. And most of us were not raised to see the themes and the stories of Scripture overarching through all of history. It's a totalitarian claim that everything will change under God's kingdom. But we often learn it in little pieces with good moral messages, like fish hearing little stories about a world they can't imagine. It doesn't change the way we see ourselves or our world, but it was meant to. There's a Chinese proverb that says, if you want to know about water... Don't ask a fish. And what it means is that this fish, this is Carlos. Say hi, Carlos. Carlos is preaching with me today. This is Tyson's. He named him. I don't. That's fine. Carlos has never been outside of his pond. Carlos has never been outside of his water or his bowl. He's so surrounded by water but that he doesn't realize how central it is to his very source of being and breathing and living. And so you don't ask a fish who's only been surrounded by water and never stepped outside to see what is really important. You don't ask him about the water. I'm going to come back to Carlos later. He'll be central later. 
See, Zacchaeus lived a life that was completely contrary to the views of Jesus, to the things he was trying to teach. He had a very different worldview. He was trying to build success and money through his tax collection practice. It tells us at the very beginning of the story he was wealthy and he was a tax collector. It tells us that a tax collector, he was known as a sinner, and here's why. Tax, he was actually a chief tax collector. So he would actually take more than it was needed. It's, it's, all of us can experience that, right? He takes more than he needed. He actually defrauds people. He lives it up while the people surrounding him in his community were struggling just to survive. This was the way he saw the world. And so you see where his values lie based on how he identifies but the Bible tells us that, the, that there are these stories spreading around Zacchaeus. He would have heard about Jesus. He would have heard about the miracles he was doing. He would have heard about the unusual teachings he was talking about. But he was only hearing about Jesus like many of us do at church once in a while. He was only hearing these stories. He couldn't quite understand what that meant to his life as a worldview shift. And so he's curious about this guy, Jesus, because it's floating around like many of us have been curious about him looking into him a little bit. But see, Zacchaeus has some issues. He can't see Jesus clearly. And that's the challenge. How do we come to see Jesus clearly of what he's really trying to do in our lives other than just be a side thing? He can't see him clearly. So there's a few things we learn. First of all, it tells us he's short, but that he's surrounded by a crowd. Jesus is coming, and Zacchaeus wants to see and learn a little more about Jesus, but he can't see him because there's a crowd surrounding him. Now, for today's purposes, we're gonna, I'm going to say that that crowd is like society that surrounds us. It's like the culture I've been raised in. Okay? It's the way society sees the world. And, G and Zacchaeus can't see through it. Because he's surrounded by it, and he can't get a clear image of who, Je who this Jesus guy is. The next thing we see is that Zacchaeus has an impediment. Some of you might, don't get offended if you're short, but he's vertically challenged. Okay? He can't see above it. He's got some personal issues that are making it hard to see Jesus, and for many of us, we have some personal stuff in our lives. Maybe it's my history. Or maybe it's your own issues that you've struggled with. Maybe it's psychological. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's you've been treated poorly in church. But there are some things in my life that have impacted me that make it hard to hear and see Jesus clearly because I'm filtering him through all these experiences. I can't see him clearly. The other thing that we see here is right away when Jesus says he's going to come to Zacchaeus' house, they go, he's a sinner. He's jacked up. See, we also, Zacchaeus has a past and a reputation that he identifies with that other people see in him. It's the way the world sees him. It's the way he sees himself. A thief, a sinner, a tax collector. See, sometimes you guys, you and I, we've carried baggage from our past of who we are that people can't see in us what we're supposed to be. And we have trouble seeing Jesus clearly of what he wants to do in you because some of you, I know, I know, I've talked to you, some of you come to a place where you're like, I can't be that close to Christ. I'm just too messed up. Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I'm doing right now? I can't receive those messages that God loves me. I can't receive that message that God wants to do something great in me because I'm too jacked up. I've got divorces. I've got sin issues. And maybe there's other people who are like, what business do you have leading or doing anything in church because you're too jacked up? See, people can't see you. That's the way the world sees you, and you have trouble receiving what Christ wants to do in you because of that, your past and your reputation. But in this story, we see that Zacchaeus has a whole world change. He rises above that stuff. He sees beyond all that stuff, all his personal issues, all the crowd, all the cultural surroundings, all his past reputation. He sees above it, 
and his whole world changes. Everything he has been doing, has been doing and the ways he sees his purpose in society, the way he values things, all that was changing in the presence of Jesus. So we're going to look at how did this come about. Well, first off, he had to get a different view. Amen? You've got to get some new eyes. You've got to rise above the mess. You've got to be able to see a new way of looking at the world. And he, so he had to get a different perspective. He couldn't see over the crowd. He couldn't see over his society. He couldn't see Jesus because he was a known sinner. To see Jesus clearly, he had to rise above it all, get his eyes on him, and give him his full attention. My question to you today is, what are you and I, what are we doing to rise above the way we've already seen the world? I don't care how long you've been a Christian. This message is for you too. This message is for me. What are we doing to continue to get above the crowd, to get above our culture, to get above the, the past and reputation and our hurts and pains in, in our lives so we can look down and see Jesus. Because I'm telling you, every time I read him, that everything he teaches me and through this whole Bible has a very contrary view to the things I've come to believe. And it's always challenged me. It never stops. So what are you doing to rise above, to get your mind and your eyes to see clearly, to listen well? Or are we just content sitting amongst the crowd getting some good stories? Hearing a little bit of good rumors about who he was. See, to see the world, to see others, and to see ourselves the way Jesus sees you, we have to get a God's eye view. We have to get a God's eye view. you got to get a perspective that sees it in completely different colors, that sees it from higher above of what everybody else is telling you. If we're going to allow Jesus, the Bible constantly talks about, you guys, this is why we're doing this. The Bible constantly talks about that when we encounter Christ truly, when his Holy Spirit is active in our lives, it begins to change our hearts. It talks about transforming of the mind. It means, it talks about, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but the patterns, everything we've learned of the pattern of how things are supposed to be, that all gets flipped upside down. It changes the reason we do what we do, even if it doesn't completely change what we're doing. It changes everything. And that's the story of the whole Bible. Genesis to Revelation. It tells us the way God intended the world. It tells us that there's a mission going on all the way to the end of time. It tells us how God views our identity. It tells us who we were made to be, and it's often not what we think it is. It tells us what is valuable, but even more so, it tells you the type of relationship he's desiring of you. And it tells you what your mission and purpose is in life. The whole narrative of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and i and I got to tell you, for all of us, it's not your fault. We have not been teaching that, and that's one of the most amazing things, is that the Bible, written by 40 people over 3,000 years, carries a theme through it of, exact, of exactly what God is wanting to do in the world around us, and it is so contrary to the way all of us have been growing and seeing the world. See, Zacchaeus is known as a tax collector and a sinner. But Jesus looks up at him. He catches his eye because Zacchaeus is standing out from the crowd looking down, trying to get a different perspective. So he catches his eye and he says, Zacchaeus, I know everybody calls you wealthy, sinner, tax collector. Will you invite me to your house? And what Jesus is doing is saying, I'm calling you friend while everybody else says you're a thief and a fraud. For the first time, Zacchaeus is seeing himself in a completely different way. Whether he liked himself or not, he's seeing himself in a completely different way. Completely different than how the world and culture and, and, and city around him saw him. He's seeing himself the way Jesus saw him. Do you see yourself the way Jesus sees you? How would you know if you don't know what the Bible speaks over our lives? Do you see with the eyes of Jesus what he sees in you? While the rest of the world sees you as something good or bad, Jesus has a much greater view and a much greater plan than whatever you and I have just stumbled into. See, before you even, need, before you even know you need him, 
He's already looked at you and known what you, could, what you could be and what he's made you to be. He already sees in you what you've been created to be. He already knows. <clears throat> I gave my life to Christ, <clears throat> I mean really, not because my parents told me, but the one where I really did something with it, at 21. Okay? And I got to tell you, like, I didn't change as fast as I would like, but my worldview changed. And I was raised well, but, I, but even being raised in a good home, Christian family, my mind completely changed. The way I saw what is valuable in the world began to change. The way I saw what I wanted to be began to change. And you know what's crazy about that is I'm having this world change, and I'm like, I'm going to go change my profession. I'm going to go serve in, in the hood. I'm going to start a nonprofit. But my reputation followed me. And people would say, what business do you have doing that? We, knew, we know who you are. You're not going to stick to that. You're not going to do that. And I had this reputation. It wasn't great. And it followed me. But I knew God was calling me to change everything. I knew I had my stuff, but I knew God was calling me to change everything I said was valuable. I knew I needed to see the world with completely new eyes. I, need, I needed to get a different way of understanding the world. But even to this day, you've probably heard it on the stage from friends I've brought here. People go, Nick Jones is a pastor? My reputation has followed me. After 12 years of ministry, my reputation is still there. You know? People think it's ridiculous. Maybe some of you have felt that. People have a hard time seeing me beyond the way they used to know me. They have a hard time seeing in me what God sees in me. But see, I rose above that noise. I rose above my own sin and issues. Not that I'm over them, but I, I rose above feeling that and living in that. And I'm trying, and I tried my best, and I continue to try my best to fix my eyes on Jesus and hear how my world is going to continue to be changed as he continues to speak life over me as he continues to speak about his mission and purpose on a global scale and on a personal one. See, 13 years ago, people could not see in me what Jesus sees in me. So they can go climb a tree. And that's what you need to hear. People will not see in you what Jesus sees in you. And if people are saying, you can't do that, you're going to fail, do you know how many times you, dra- you, you jacked up? Do you know how many times you've struggled with addiction and, and kept doing it? You know, when people continue to speak that stuff over you, how are you going to do that? You can tell, go, home, go climb a tree. You need a different eye. You need a different worldview. You can't see in me what Jesus sees in me. Christ changes everything. He transforms the mind. He transforms the world. And he transforms the way we experience it and live for it. I want you to think about this. Jesus encounters Zacchaeus. They go to dinner. Within a dinner, according to the story, what does Zacchaeus do? What does he do? He gives his life. He goes, everything's so different. I have made all this money, and if I have, I'm going to give half of it to the poor. I didn't give a rip about them before you came to my house. But I'm starting to see what is valuable, not because this brings me salvation, but because I'm realizing what you value by spending time in your presence. And then he goes, okay, and if I've defrauded anybody, if I've sinned against anybody, if I've hurt people or my friends and family or my neighbors, if I've done anything, I'm going to pay back four times as much as what I stole from them. He didn't just reconcile. The guy changed his whole social structure. He actually did more. The law required some retribution, some restoration. But the law, he went above and beyond the law. He did more than he had to do because his values, his worldview, what he thought was important began to change because he was in the presence of Jesus hearing and listening at a dinner table about what his kingdom is going to look like. 
his whole view of himself began to change. He used to be chasing money, and everything he valued has been flipped upside down. How does this happen? How do we begin to allow Jesus to transform our minds and our hearts? To transform. That's the word the Bible uses. Transformed mind. Look at these statements. First off, in verse 5, it says, Today I want to come eat at your house. I must stay at your house, Jesus says to Zacchaeus. Today I must stay at your house. But what does Jesus say at the end in verse 9? He says, today salvation has come to this house. Step one, stop making Jesus a visitor. Start making him a fixture of your home. Start making him a fixture of your life, of your work, of your job. See, today I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to pray with you for five seconds before your meal. But now that you've given your whole life to the worldview I'm living, I'm pushing on you, Jesus is saying. He says, today salvation has come to your home. He didn't say salvation has come to you. He said his whole household, his oikos, his whole household, his, the people he considers family, is going to experience the salvation of God because Zacchaeus has got it. He allowed everything to be transformed. And for us, that's what we have to do. If we want Jesus to begin to change everything in us, and it's really hard for us who have been doing okay, but he even wants to change everything in you if you're doing okay. He didn't make you for okay. He made you for greatness. He made you for world transformation. And it's really hard for us, but if we're going to do that, you've got to get a God's eye view of the way he views your purpose, your vocation, your calling. I don't even need to know where you're coming from. I don't need to know your story. I'd like to, but I don't need to know that. Because God's worldview turns everyone's upside down. Read the scriptures. There's nobody who encounters him and he goes, actually, you got it. You figured it out already. Nobody. It doesn't matter if they were wealthy, poor. It didn't matter if they were this. There was like four political parties surrounding Jesus, and, he all, and every one of them would go, you're with us, right? He'd go, uh, actually, you've missed it. Oh, you're completely opposite of them? Oh, oh, you've missed it too. Every person he encounters, he says, you don't understand. My world is beyond the pond. You're still playing games in the pond. You haven't gotten out of the pond. You haven't seen a God's eye view of what I'm calling you to. It is completely contrary to what you can imagine. Right now, fish is fish. Everything you filter through, you're seen as your little microcosm of fish. But I've got something completely different. How do we get that view? We have to begin to fix our eyes on Jesus and allow him to reveal just how different his view of the world is. Now, if you're in your Bibles, Colossians 3, we're gonna, I have it on the screen as well, but I encourage you to always read your Bible. Jesus will speak through you, uh, to you through his spirit. Colossians 3 verse 2 says this. Since then, listen to close to these words. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. That's fixate. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the world surrounding you. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Set your hearts. It means concentrate. Concentrate your will. Concentrate your affections. Concentrate your loves. Concentrate your emotions. Fix your eyes. Fix your heart. Fix your mind. Be fixated on the world he's trying to reveal to you and ask him, reveal the ways I think everything should be and how it's contrary to your, your world. Romans 12 says something similar. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many of you want to know God's will for your life? I hope so. We talk about God's will all the time. I don't have time for this to get get on you about that. I'll get to that someday. Because we use it so interestingly. But he says this, 
Do not conform to the pattern. This, there's a word that, the, that this is used in the Greek. It actually is a word where we derive the word schema from. And schema in de- child development and psychology means the, the th- ways your mind interprets the world, the systems in which you see it. He says, don't have a pattern of this world. Don't have the schema of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See it completely different. You cannot fit in if you know the world Jesus is trying to create. And if you are transformed in your mind by seeing the way Jesus sees with a God's eye view, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and perfect will. Then, you're asking about God's will in the pond. This is all he's got for you, Carlos. It's all you're living for right there. Swimming in circles. See what it's saying. Listen, look, seek constantly. And he will begin revealing a whole new world to you. You'll be like Aladdin. <laughs> I'm not singing this time. No, I'm not in the mood. I'm, I lost my breath trying to run in here this morning. <laughs> And you'll begin to see what is good and perfect plan and will and desire. That's what that word will means, his desire for the world, what it is for you. Fixate on me. I've got a whole different world and you can't even fathom it right now. So what are you putting your mind to? What are you seeking? What is Paul talking about in these verses? We are going to be shaped. If we don't fixate on Jesus, you're going to be shaped by the schema of this world. You can't avoid it. Even if you think you're super, like, you know, autonomous and, you know, like you're your own personality and extremely rational. You don't even know where half your thoughts came from. And he says, if you don't, you're going to live the story of postmodernism. You're going to live the story of your politics. You're going to live the story of the people in power and whatever culture you're raised in. You're going to live the story that's been placed on you. You're living somebody's story. And he's saying, I've got a story of the whole world, and I have plans for you to be a part of it. But it's completely contrary to the way you see it. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad to you. Today, I'm excited to share the ways that redeemers and our team and our leaders here are trying to talk about how do we begin to allow God to transform our hearts and our minds and our vocations and our calling. These are all the new ways you can get involved today. Now, we had a huge success last season. I mean, way more people in life groups than we thought. We did micro groups and that quadrupled what we planned on. We're hearing amazing stories If you didn't do it, you're bad. You missed out. But we're starting again. Microgroups are coming later this fall. And if you haven't been talking to people, talk to people. It's made a world of difference. And I know we're strapped for time because we're living in the patterns of this world. All of us. Me too. The patterns of this world don't give us time. I know we're strapped. And that's why you got to go climb a tree. That's why you've got to say, I'm going to do what it takes to get a different view and see what God's going to do with me. So if you, uh, where I put my card? There it is. If you guys had your bulletins, you have these cards. And this is kind of our growth model over the next few years. You know, we've presented this last year, but this is a little cleaner. It tells you, here's the ways to start addressing it. It might seem like a lot, but we're talking about over time in a community of believers How do you get involved in areas that begin to shape the way your heart and your mind experience the world, the way you shape what you do in the world? And it's broken out. We have formation classes. These formation classes have been developed to address different areas of the way we experience God, the way we think about God. And the first one I'm excited to talk about is one I'm writing right now called The Drama of Scripture. Now, it's going to sound like a beginner's course. Now, we used to do Joy of Discovery. We're going to continue to do Joy of Discovery, but we've moved that to an advanced course because it was a little hard for people just starting into the Bible. And that's okay. It should be. It is. The Bible, so often in church we go, hey, you want to grow, go read your Bible. 
I'm not going to tell you that because if you just flip it open to, you know, I don't know, any of the Old Testament prophets or Lamentations, you probably aren't going to last very long in it because it seems weird. It's not. I'm not putting it down. It's that we don't understand how it fits into God's grand story because we haven't been taught to see it from a God's eye view. And what I love, if you know me, you know I'm a skeptic by nature. You know I've come with struggling with faith. And the reason I'm able to put my trust in the word of God is not just because I was told to. It's because I ended up seeing these threads that go through every story, every book of the Bible over 3,000 years on from three different continents, from 40 different authors, and somehow it ties together a overarching story of what God is doing in the world. And it tells you how to make sense of the weird stuff in scripture. It tells you how to understand what God is trying to do in your life. It tries to tell you what the world is supposed to look like and where we're heading and until you get that larger view all you're going to do is see fish as fish you're going to go oh man David said this really cool thing on Facebook today on his quote and it was so encouraging to my current schema he doesn't want to encourage your current patterns he wants to encourage you to experience the fullness of the world as he intended it. He wants to encourage you, just not false encouragement, to fit into the patterns of the world of the way you and I see it. And so we're going to be teaching a class. It's, we're not going to get deep into one book. We're going to see the overarching threads and the storyline and what it means for our worldview. And we're going to look at what that means for the way we see everything. So that's something we're launching. I'm excited about it. Secondly, we're redoing Digging Deeper Life Groups. Those were a tremendous success last year. I'm going to share with you some stories about people who have been impacted by the Digging Deeper Life Groups because it began to reshape the way they saw community faith. It began to encourage and support them. This is something that changes the heart, but it also changes the mind. At Digging Deeper, we take Sundays, we get beyond it, and we go into a group of people all wrestling with life, trying to understand and unpack the message of God for with each other. I'm going to share some testimonies here if you'll play the video. I, um, I started attending Redeemers um, last summer and so um, this January I decided I wanted to really feel a part of this um, community of believers and so I decided to participate in one of the life groups. Um, I didn't know a lot of people so I decided the facilitator could just put me wherever she wanted to and but I prayed and asked that the Lord would put me in a group that could be very meaningful to me and I I really felt like the group was just handpicked by God because um, the, the the participants were very very open and welcoming and I felt a part of the group right from the very beginning in seeing the um, the women in the group that have had the same struggles that that I am going through currently, I really felt that by seeing how God is healing them, it gives me a hope that that He's also healing me, and I can feel that. One of the things we do in the Bible uh, the Bible study is dig deeper into the sermons that um, Pastor Nick has given us on Sunday and I find his messages very um, challenging and captivating and I get really excited when I can think about oh boy on Wednesday we're gonna get to talk more about this and I would encourage anybody who is looking for a way to be more involved in this church to join a life group. I think that they are designed specifically for people to grow closer to each other and to the Lord. And, you know, with a large church, sometimes you're not able to speak, you know, to, to meet everybody. But here you've got a, a, a small group of people that you can really rely on and count on and support you. So I am new to faith. I've always gone to church as a kid with my mom. We're from a Catholic family. Um, she's a really strong Catholic woman, so we've always gone to that. Um, I feel like it was more 
you're a child, you're coming to church type of thing. I never really felt connected. Um, coming to Redeemers, my brother and my sister-in-law had started coming to Redeemers. Um, they continued to talk to me about it. I was going through a really rough patch in my life, feeling at my lowest um, in many different ways. And he kept telling me, what are you waiting for? And I felt, I think like a lot of people, um, I don't belong in church. Um, I've been coming for a little bit over a year now and I've just grown so much. Like I, ever once I started coming, I just kept telling myself, why did I wait so long? Like this feeling I never want to let go. So what made me decide to join Life Group was I think it was it, it was offered and my sister-in-law said oh I really want to join and I'm like I was really interested as well in wanting to join um, I was pretty scared to join because I was very new I started in July and I want to say we started taking signups in August so I was really really new I love this so much I love being in the word I want to know more I want to grow more in faith and just I just could not get enough of it um, so I decided to join the life group, terrified, but I, I did it and it was one of the best decisions that I made. Um, something that I can say that I've grown, you know, and learned from going to life group is just to become more trusting in God. Um, I feel like before if things went wrong in my life, whether I was praying or not, I was really quick to, you know, not be faithful and just kind of give up. You know, never, nothing is ever going to be perfect in your life. You're going to have your ups and downs. Um, life Group has really taught me how to, a different way to deal with those bumps and those stormy seasons that come our way. Um, I feel like I've just become so much stronger in faith and, you know, trusting just uh, that I know that everything that happens is happening, you know, for a reason. It's growing me. I've just, you know, building these relationships with total strangers. I knew nobody. We've built strong relationships in our group to where people, we were able to open up to one another um, and know that not, maybe not at that same time, but somebody else has gone through the same situation that you've gone through. And I felt like it was really important um, for me to just talk to people who were like-minded, um, who had the same goal as me, rather than going to friends and you know gossiping. Um, it was very healthy and it, it was just really nice to be able to open up and talk to people and not feel judged. So um, if you are on the fence of whether you should join Life Group or not, I would say to hop that fence. Just myself and my experience being so terrified to join just because I didn't know anybody. I was very new. I didn't feel like I was um, in a place where I should, that I can speak about God or, you know, um, didn't know enough to be able to speak about God, but that is not the case. You're there to learn, you're there to grow, um, to be supported. And I would say, take that jump, do it, join it. You're gonna love it, you will not regret it. So it affected me individually by wanting to be in my word so much more and learning, you know, it gave me an outline of what to study, and it was it was so good for me. There's something to be said just about jumping right in and and not worrying too much about it of, of how people are going to accept you or or you're not going to fit well. You will. Um, just being able to have that close knit group. It was just something you don't get every day, even with your own friends. And we just, we really just had a great time together. You just learn to grow from everyone, not just being the leader, but uh, the whole group. The whole group was so helpful. You're reading, you're reading God's word and you're studying his word and you're doing it with everybody else and, and everybody who's, who's in these life groups, they're eager to learn. And you find out you're learning from each other's experiences. Um, and you're learning just through friendship, through relationships, 
and it, it brought us closer as husband and wife, it, it, people that we never even knew who even went to this church. You're meeting them for the first time, and, and now it's every Sunday, every uh, Wednesday, um, you see these people, and, and, and you're just so glad to see them. And uh, they're just new friends. We hope that if anybody's worrying about that type of stuff and, and not wanting to just get right into it, please do. It, it works out for the best, and the, and the best part of it is you're in a community with, with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, it's just a wonderful thing. Amen. Yeah, give him a hand. I'm going to close here as we go out to Sunday Fun Day. But Carlos, Carlos, it's your time, my friend. Ty Tyson's not in here, right? All right. Here's the thing about Carlos. Carlos, like I said, he spent his whole life in the bowl. He spent his whole life in water. You can't ask Carlos about water. Carlos doesn't realize how important it is. Carlos, Carlos does not realize how important water is. All my PETA people, they can live up to six hours outside of water. <laughs> Chill. <laughs> Carlos is now learning how important water is. Paul Carlos has now a different view of the world. He had to rise above his pond. And now, see, he has spent his whole life surrounded by water. It is the reason he lives. It is the reason he breathes. It is the reason he even exists. And today, he has risen above and he's learning just how he needs to really understand and appreciate water. How his whole life is about water. The water. All right. You get out of there, Carlos. His whole life is about the water. And he couldn't even told you much about it until I took him out. And he doesn't know everything there is to know about water. He's got a lot to learn about it. Oh, he's... <laughs> You'll be all right, buddy. I Googled it. <laughs> Listen, sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when God changes your view, it messes everything up. Yeah. Carlos, get up, baby. You got this. All right. Yeah, see, he's moving. Uh, there he goes. He's back. All right. Sometimes God takes your breath away. Oh, he's down. All right, we'll give him some time. Sometimes God takes your breath away. Because he changes everything, and you're just in awe. And it's when you get that different view, it's when you rise above your pond, it's when you see this different world that you come back and you go, you know what, I'm back, but my whole life depends on this. See, some of you, I love new Christians. So many of you new Christians come in here, we've had a lot this year, and you tell me, oh, I just don't know about the Bible, it makes me nervous. I love you. Because when you come in and you see the scriptures, you go, that's completely different. That is completely different than anything I understood. But for us who have been Christians for a long time, we've been living in the water. And we just take it for granted. We take it for granted that our whole existence, everything we are made for, is contingent on that water. And it's been surrounding us the whole time. And it is time for all of us, whether you're new, whether you're doubting, whether you're struggling, whether you've been a long-term Christian, and you're the hardest, and I love you. 
But if you've been a long-term Christian, it's time to ask God, are you ready to give me a new worldview, to continue to reshape the patterns of my mind and my heart? So my challenge to you is, are you going to be like Zacchaeus? Are you, it's time to say, God, I've been having all this insecurity, all this doubt, all these struggles. And I'm going to rise above it. I've got all these people who have this reputation of what I'm supposed to be. Maybe they expect you to be super Christian and internally you know you're not. Maybe they expect you to be jacked up. But internally, you know what you really want in your life. Are you willing to climb a tree to get a different perspective? Are you willing to hop out of the pond to mix my metaphors? Are you willing to rise above it and say, God, I want to concentrate. I want to set my mind. I want to fix my eyes on this world you keep telling me this is about. Well, if that's you, then it's time to go climb a tree and get a clearer vision of what Jesus is, not the cultural version of it, not white Jesus. I'm talking about historically God's own son who came and flipped the world upside down. Not an enculturated model of who he is. Are you ready to get that, church? Are you ready to go in? No? Are you ready to go in and let him change your worldview? Then you've got to be like that tadpole in the fish is fish story. And you need to grow some legs, walk your butt outside the pond, and sign up for a new world for a new way of seeing and and concentrate your mind and your heart and your time and say, God, what are you trying to show me that's different? What are you trying to show me that reorients my values? I'm going to ask you for a commitment today. I would say about 40% of our church is involved in groups. It's awesome. It's actually a great mark. And then the other half, you come here on Sundays, you're part of the family, but you're not experiencing the benefits of it. I'm going to ask you to take your card. I'm going to ask you to think about, I've told you about the class. We've told you about life groups. We'll tell you more later, but we also have a margin group about getting some space and freeing up your life a little bit to focus on Christ. We've got multiple things happening. We have service areas where you begin to form a community with other people serving and seeing what God wants to do and how you impact others in the world, both in the community and within the church and within children and within teenagers. I want everybody to take a next step. I don't care where you're at to take a next step. Our goal is, at, if you've been a member here for a while, is that you'll fill up every one of those boxes. They literally are check boxes. To give us a pathway to continue to address those areas in our lives. Now, here's my challenge to you. Who is willing, whether you're doing it already or not, to take a leap to get uncomfortable and say, I'm going to go a little deeper in this. See, this church is growing. Who is willing to join me? I want you to hold up your card. Don't embarrass me. Come on. See, that's about 50% of our church. Come on, other 50. Are you willing to take that next step? This church this year, this last six months, has grown in every area. It's grown in attendance. It's grown in children's. It's grown in teens. It's grown in ministry. But I don't care about any of that unless you and I are growing. How are you growing? And that's what this is about, growth change, development, and it goes on to the end of our lives. It doesn't matter where you are, where, you, where you've been, it matters where you're going to start. And my challenge for you is to go outside, enjoy the day, have some fun, let the kids play, but take time to learn from the leaders at the tables how you can get involved, take one step into the community of faith, and say, God, how will you change my view? Will you join me in that? Will you be serious this year, church? You're too quiet for me today. Will you be serious this year, church? Yeah. All right. I'm going to take that as a commitment. Will you stand with me as we pray and go have a great day today? If you go outside, we're doing a bake sale for women's ministry, uh, we're raising funds for camp. You can go do auction items to buy desserts. First come, first serve. Whoever wins, they get the goods. You better outbid them or make friends with them. Amen. Frito boats are there as well as a fundraiser. We got stuff for the kids. But visit the booths first. 
just go out and get to know what's going on, all right? And it's just really get some information, take that next step, take your cards, check it off, drop it in the basket, whatever you want to do. I'm going to pray for us. Lord God, thank you so much that we can join together, Lord. I thank you for this fellowship of people. I thank you for this family. I thank you for this community of friends. I thank you for these people who have come and said, God, I want to learn more about you. Lord, I'm here, God. And right now I just pray for all of us. We all have different reasons why it's hard to continue to fixate our eyes on you. For all of us. Maybe it's some sin. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's stress. Lord God, I pray that you will help us take a different view, to take a leap, to figure out what it's going to take, Lord, to fixate our family, to fixate our household, to fixate our children, to fixate our wives to fixate our husbands on you Lord this season so Lord God I just pray that you will stir in our hearts that your grace and peace will be on redeemers Lord I pray that you'll expand our witness through this body into the community I pray that you'll expand it into neighborhoods I, sp I pray that you'll expand it into workplaces I pray that you will give us a new vision for the oldest story ever told Will you help us see how we fit into what you're trying to do into each and every one of our lives? I pray power. I pray your Holy Spirit over everybody in this congregation. I pray that you pour it out, that you give us new eyes, new hearts to see what you are wanting to do with us. And I pray that it messes us up so that it makes a change and impact on, this, on the world that we are involved in right now. I thank you for all the people here. May his grace and peace and blessings be on you this week as you go. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'll see you outside.